Uh, finding love is hard. Can I get an amen from anyone? Amen. Finding love in our world can be hard. Now, the second you say that, all the single people start going, oh, no, he's going to talk about marriage. And guess what? I am. I'm going to talk a little bit about marriage. But I'm not just talking about marriage love. I'm talking about love at work. I'm talking about love from your kids. How many know sometimes your kids don't love you? I'm talking about friendship love. I'm talking about, I'm talking about love from your pets, not your dog, your cat. <laughs> love is hard to find. It's work. My, um, my story, is it, can I tell you a Kelly and I story oh, just a little bit? Do you mind if I tell you our story? Okay, that was, I got one person. I'm just going to tell it to you. The rest of you are like, no, we have dip at home. Let's go. I'm going to tell it to you whether you want to know it or not. And single people, don't get all weirded out. But I'm, I'm talking to you too. Uh, you know, don't let anyone make you feel ashamed for being single on Valentine's Day weekend. There are nothing wrong with being single. I'm gonna talk about my marriage. That doesn't mean I think there's something wrong with you being single. I'm not pressuring you. You know who you remind me of single people? You remind me of that really successful person. They, um, what was his name? Jesus. That's right, Jesus, <laughs> who is also single. See how that works? There's, if Jesus was single, you're fine. But I didn't want to be single, um, so I found Kelly Harlow. She's awesome. She's like 30% more saved than you, and she was amazing, and I wanted to be with her, and she didn't want to be with me. My wife broke up with me three times before we got engaged, three different times. The second time she broke up with me, she looked me right in the eye. She swears she doesn't remember this, but I do. She looked me right in the eye, and she said, Kurt, not everyone is attracted to everyone else. For instance, I am not attracted to you. Now, single ladies, let me tell you what's going on there because there's a, there's a side sermon in that. When you break up with a man, you can't do it by hint. Men do not speak hint. You gotta be straightforward. You gotta stick the knife in, then turn it, turn it. <laughs> or he won't get it. So what happened is the first time she broke up with me, I went and I got all of her friends to be on my side and they all were like, you should be with that guy. He's really funny. And, and then the second time, she broke up with me. I went and I convinced her mom to be on my side. I cooked her roast beef and homemade bread and potatoes and salad and all, I'm not joking, apple pie. And she's like, why are you not with that guy that can cook? And then the third time she sat down, she broke up with me. And because of those first two times, she gave me rules. She said, here are the rules of our breakup. Number one, when you walk into a room I'm in, you can't walk in all sad like I broke your heart. You gotta smile, you gotta fake it till you make it. I don't wanna see all them sad sack things. Number two, you can't sit by me. You can't talk to my friends. You can't talk to my mom. And you got to pretend you're happy and no talking. <laughs> she was afraid of my talking. So I let a couple of months go by. And do you want to hear how I? Okay, okay. Now you do. Now you do. <laughs> so I let a couple of months go by. And she was into J.R.R. Tolkien. And I read C.S. Lewis. I didn't read any Tolkien, you know, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit and all that stuff. And so I'm like, I'm going to read all that Tolkien stuff. So I start reading it, and that stuff is confusing. I mean, every character's got three names. There's a kingdom, but the king doesn't live in the kingdom. He lives with the elves, and the elves don't die unless they go to war, which they do all the time. If I didn't ever die unless I went to war, I'd never go to war, but they do. And I'm like, I got all these questions. So I, I timidly approached her. I said, listen, um, I, I'm, I'm starting to read J.R.R. Tolkien, and if I have any questions, can I bring my questions to you or does that violate the rules? And she's like, no, you can ask the questions. So I'd start asking her these questions. And then I finally said to her, I said, listen, I got so many questions uh, about this. What if I took you out to lunch? I bought us some lunch. She said, you can take me out to lunch. And then I said, you know, it's really hard. Like while I'm reading it, I need the question answered right then. So here's what I think we should do. I should come over on a Friday night I'll cook you a dinner. I'll light uh, the fire in the fireplace and then you sit on the couch and I will sit at your feet and I will read you aloud J.R.R. Tolkien. And six months later, we were engaged, son. We were engaged. So you're a young man in this room. You're saying, if I read aloud to the girl I like, will I get engaged? I got four kids, my brother. So that's all I'm saying. But it was hard work. And there was a lot of heartache and there were some tears in it. Finding love is hard. Can anyone give me an amen? Yeah. This is why 1 Corinthians 13 is such a powerful chapter. Because Paul literally describes 
how we can find love and how we can live in love and the exclusive higher way of love can come into our life. You gotta start in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31 to understand 1 Corinthians 13. It's one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible. It's the best thing that's ever been written about love in any book anywhere. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it starts off by saying this, and, I, and, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. That verse should actually be in chapter 13, I think, because what Paul is doing here is he's answering a letter from the Corinthians and he's being very specific. So he's answering their letter and he's giving them instructions and a lot of correction. He's being technical. He's being very, very specific. And in the middle of this really specific instruction, he stops and he goes away from specific instruction and he elevates it to poetry. And he says, listen, listen, you can understand all the lessons I'm teaching, but if you don't get up here, if you don't find the excellent way, your life will be meaningless. And yet, if you do, if you see this excellent way, you'll find love. Why do they need this exhortation? They're very divided. They're very divided. Chapter 10 tells us there's divisions over diets. There's so many divisions in this book, but one of the main ones is they're arguing over, can you eat meat, sacrifice to idols? We taught all about that uh, a few months ago. Go look at those sermons. Then they're also divided over how you dress at church. Uh, Should women cover their heads? And there was a cultural issue there. It's very technical, and they're fighting over that. The main thing they're fighting over, though, is the third one. There's division over different gifts. Some are doing the gifts that God has given them in a way that It's very divisive and showy. And Paul's trying to go, don't be like a celebrity gift person. Don't be like a star gift person. Be a servant gift person. And they're all in confusion and division over gifts. They are divided and divided and divided and divided. I wonder if in all their division, there's a lesson for us. Because we're pretty divided, amen? Amen. USC uh, just got done doing this big study. And this is so funny about academics. They do this all the time. They, they spend a lot of money and ask a lot of questions to come up with a result that we already knew was true, right? And what they've decided is that we are more divided in America right now than we ever have been since the Civil War. What are we divided over? We're divided over governmental mandates. We're divided over sexual morals. We're divided over economic measures. We're divided over educational methods. All the fundamental stuff we're divided over. And what we think we're going to do, and this is what's so crazy about us, is we think we're going to become undivided by yelling at each other online. We think we're going to become undivided and we're going to win the issue. And these are important issues, right? We think we're going to win the issue by making comments on Twitter. Listen, debate never, ever does anything but divide people more. You want to get our culture on the right track? Stop being good at debate and start being good at loving. Loving's how you change people. Loving's how you change people. How do you love people? Here's the big picture. Um, This chapter is more about a family feud than a fancy wedding. Now, a lot of people will read this passage and they'll read it at their weddings. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you read this at your wedding, good job. It's a great passage. It stands alone. It's very, very beautiful. But don't get the understanding that this is sort of, you know, tender poetry that describes the beautiful day of your wedding nuptials or some beautiful moment, you know. This is not what's happening. The Apostle Paul is walking into a Jerry Springer-esque family feud where people are looking at maternity tests and throwing chairs. And He's saying, you guys, there's an urgency in the Apostle Paul here. And in our moment, in this culture, being so divided, we need to feel this same urgency. The passage is divided into three sections. It's a shorter chapter. It's divided into three sections. And each section is making the same point, and the point is that love is the most excellent way. It's the highest priority. He makes it in a slightly different way. The first section, I call it cautions, the priority of love. So what Paul is trying to do is is get us to see that there is no other choice if we want to move forward than to lift love up. And he's cautioning us about even doing good things outside of love. If you're still with me, give me an amen. Verse one, we're just read the whole chapter and, uh, and, and learn a few things and then we're gonna apply it. Okay, so verse one, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, 
but do not have love, I am nothing. Now stop right there. Sometimes you'll read commentaries, you'll listen to certain teachers, really teachers I respect actually, and they'll, we'll, there'll be a little um, theological debate here. Some people use that passage to teach that supernatural gifts have passed away and there are no more supernatural gifts in the church. I, your pastor, I do not believe that's the correct interpretation. Respect those people. I understand their logic here. Um, but, but here and then again in the last paragraph, they'll make this argument. A little bit later, I'll tell you exactly why I don't think that's the proper interpretation. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith and can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Then he uses one more example. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the hardships that I may boast, but I do this without love, I do not have love, I gain nothing. So what he's simply saying here is take caution. You can do good things without love. Then he moves on, the descriptors of love. And this is, this is verb heavy. So Greek, it's all right if I teach a little bit this morning. It's all right if I teach. We're getting to some Greek. Turn your neighbor and say, turn your frontal lobe on. Go ahead, turn it on. Sit up straight. I promise not to be like your eighth grade teacher that bored you. We're going to have some fun, but we're going to learn some stuff. So Greek, it doesn't have any uh, punctuation. There's no periods. There's no explanation points. There's no question marks. It doesn't even have spaces. If you look at Greek, all the letters are just right next to each other, line after line after line after line. And so all the paragraphs you see are added by the editors and translators in here. And so um, when he gets to this next one, if you read it in the Greek, you'd go, wow, those are powerful verbs. There's 16 of them. You would feel the explanation points, but you feel them by the word choice, not by the punctuation. Does that make sense? So I want you to read these verbs in here and I want you to feel the power of them. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. When you, uh, there's, there's 16 of them, seven are positive and nine are negative. Seven are, this is what love is, and nine are, it never does this. It never will do this. And from that positive and negative angle, he just gives us this perfect uh, picture of what love is, and then he ends with this phrase, love never fails. Now, a lot of you in your Bible, you'll find love never fails is in the next paragraph. I don't think that's... Uh, that's not the way that I would do it. I think the love never fails connects the two paragraphs. When you get that idea that love is a building that will never come down, then he gives you the examples of some things that will come to an end. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Again, some people use this to say that the church no longer should have these things. I don't really think that's true. And the reason is, okay, if prophecy cease and tongues cease, does that mean that knowledge has ceased? Some of you listen to my preaching every week and you're like, yeah, maybe. No, just let's move on. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. What's completeness? Uh, Jesus' whole kingdom, when he takes over everything again. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, the ch I put the things of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. You know what a great skill is when you're reading the Bible is whenever there's an analogy or a metaphor or a symbol, you gotta stop and ask yourself, what did that mean to them? Because um, what a mirror means to me is not what it meant to them. So like, uh, have you guys ever stayed in a nicer hotel room and they have that, that magnified mirror hooked to the wall and it lights up, it has a ring of light around it. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't look at that thing, that's horrible. <laughs> you look at that thing and you're like, I am the ugliest human ever, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I need that thing from the internet that removes blackheads, babe. I mean, it's just, it's horrible, right? This is not what they meant as a mirror. I've, I've got a first century mirror right here. This one's patinaed with, uh, with all the corrosion from over the years, but that's less than four inches across. It was bronze or tin, the mirror that he's talking about, and they would polish it as hard as they could, but you still wouldn't see very well in this mirror. Like you could never use that mirror to help grandpa get his nose hairs trimmed. You could never do it. 
Oh, if you're not helping grandpa get his nose hair straight, you are not a good family member. That is like a thing. So that's their mirror. So let's read it again. We'll read it with that understanding. Um, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in a tin or bronze, poorly polished, small little mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Man, the Bible's so beautiful. I don't know everything, but God knows everything about me. I am fully known by my creator. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's just the whole point of the chapter is the elevating love. Um, let's go back to the cautions really, really quickly, and then we're going to get into the definitions. Uh, what is love? Um, what kind of priority should love have? Here's why I don't believe that first part teaches the cessation of the supernatural. What Paul is doing here is really, really cool. It's very smart. He's taking the three most positive things he can think of, and he's saying even these things that are wildly positive, if you do them without love, they become a negative. So love... Uh, taken away from a positive, it can never be a positive. So the three that he lists are simply this, miraculous works, mind-blowing insights, and magnificent generosity. So he's saying, if you have miraculous works without love, it's just obnoxious noise. You're, just, you're, you're not helping anyone. No one is getting more helped by your miraculous works if they are done without love. By the way, I've been to this church. I've been to this church where there's a lot of noise but it's not done in love. And then he's saying, you can be super smart. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have insight. But if your insight doesn't have love in it, you're actually going to use that insight for wrong reasons and you're going to hurt people. And then this is the one that blows my mind. He's like, even if you give everything you have to the poor, you can't think of a better thing. But I can tell you story after story where actual donations have been made to the poor, but they were made out of ego and arrogance and appearance, and it hurt both the donator and the donatee. When you take love out of even something that's wildly good, it becomes evil. The opposite's also true. If you put a little bit of love into something that's flawed, we all know this to be true. We've all worked with someone who's wildly talented, but they're mean as snot, right? Right? And they're like, oh, they're the best salesperson ever. They're the best uh, um, project manager ever. They get things done, but they run over people on their way. And eventually you're like, I don't care how effective they are. I am not going to work with these people. And you've also worked with someone who, who doesn't have it all together. They're a little bit flawed. They're still learning their job. They're not great at some things, but they're fun to work with and they're loving to work with. And they're a great teammate. And you're like, I'll help you out because I love working with you. Without love. Even good things are bad. That's just all he's saying. Here's the foundational principle. Fill it in. If you're worried about this, this week's great truth. Here it is. Five great truths, five chapters. Here's the great truth. Everything requires love. Everything requires love. Your vocation requires love. Your finances require love. Your attitude requires love. Your self-image requires love. Your relationships of all sorts require love. Your roommates require love. Your dog requires love. Your cat requires a double dose of love. Everything requires love. When you put love into things, even flawed things get better. In the end, how you love people is the only thing that matters. No one in the end is going to care how much you own, what your titles are, how well you knew, what your followers on Instagram are. In the end, the only thing that will matter is if you were loving. And by the way, if you find love, and become a lover. And these verbs are in your life. Not only will your life matter, it will matter for all eternity. What you do in love will last forever. You want to have a significant life. You got to do these verbs. All right. 
How do we do the verbs? How do we do the verbs? Descriptions, the actions of love. Okay, we're going to get into Greek. I got a lot of Greek for you today. And I, I got some pushback on this. People are like, you know, don't teach that much Greek. You're going to intimidate people. They're going to feel like they went to church and it was school. And I'll, just a couple things about the Greek. First of all, it's good for us every once in a while to recognize that we are studying a translation. In the New Testament, uh, almost all of it's Greek, Greek to English. We're studying a translation. But just don't, don't get intimidated by that. There's two things that happen whenever you teach on Greek. First of all, you look like an idiot. Uh, if you're me, you look like an idiot because I'm not good at Greek. I had a Greek student in my ministry when I was at UOP and I said a Greek word in a message one night and uh, it was a common word. It was like koinonia or leilus, a word I'd heard many times before. And after the message, she came right up to me and she said, Pastor Kurt, let me teach you how to pronounce that word correctly. And she said the word in the Greek. And I said, well, I was kidding with her. I said, you know, I was pronouncing the ancient Greek. So that's why it was different than what you speak as a Greek person. And she looked at me, she said, Pastor, Kurt, let me tell you, no Greek person ever has said that word the way you say that word. So if you want me to pronounce any of these Greek words, you're going to be disappointed. But the reason I bring them out is what I said earlier. There's so many choices in the Greek. How the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use these words is very insightful. It's very fun. But don't let that undermine your confidence in the translation. Just because there's some nuance to this and you're going to learn a few things, don't, don't get a lack of confidence in your English translation. Because you live at a time where the scholarship is so good and the access to the manuscripts. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of ancient Greek manuscripts, most of them we found in a garbage dump in Egypt, that's a true story, that we know more about the Greek now than we've ever known, and your translation is awesome. But still, it's fun to go through the exercise and go, why did the Holy Spirit pick that word? Okay, a few words. Are you ready? Give me an amen if you're ready. Let's go fast. Uh, the first word is patient. In the Greek, it means delays giving up. The delaying of giving up. I should give up, not gonna. I should lose heart, not gonna. I should say, that son of mine, that daughter of mine, that friend of mine, my mom, my dad, my husband, my wife, I'm ready to give up, but no. I'm a lover. I delay giving up. I put off giving up. The next one is kind. This one, it really is true that the Greek has a slightly different flavor than we do in the English. In the English, kind means polite. It means gentle. It means, uh, you know, they say please, they say thank you, they listen, they don't interrupt. That's a kind person. In the Greek, it has the extra thought of takes action. It's goodness in action. So it's not just a kind thought towards you. It's a kind action. I look at you and I discern your needs and I act on your needs. That's what it means to be a loving, kind person. Um, does not envy. This is a big one. Does not resent the success of others. We are so competitive in our culture. We are so comparison oriented in our culture that frequently we give in to the sin of envy and we are not convicted about it. We don't even realize that we're walking in envy. We're comparison all the time. We're like, we're looking at people and we're like, well, how did they get that new F-150, Ford F-150, man? I was like, no chips, there's no chips. I don't know how he got the one chip. He can't afford that. I know his job. I'm like, God, I'm driving around in Ford F-150. It's probably a Chinese spy. <laughs> you know, you're going to get so much happier when you stop comparing your life to other people. All right, let's keep moving. We got a lot to go here. Um, does not boast. This does not, this means that I do not self-promote. I don't have the need to self-promote. Uh, when, when when our kids were small, one of the elementary schools did a little play and I can remember this kid that just had energy, I mean, he was just bouncing off the walls and I think they did this on purpose. They put him in the tree costume, right? Because it's like a tube that's like a straight jacket. So they, they pour this kid into there and he just can he's got like one line early on in the play and then he's just supposed to sit there and be a tree. But what he does is he just starts creeping to the center of the stage. <laughs> This tree just starts walking and all of a sudden like the main characters are having their dialogue and the tree's looking over them. And so the teacher gets up on stage and she pulls him back to the bush where he's supposed to stand and then he sees his mom and he just starts walking towards her and she pulls him back. I wonder how many of us do that. You don't even like the center of the stage, but you just don't like it that someone else has got it. And slowly but surely at work, in your apartment, in your house, in your family. What love does is it lets someone else be center stage. You know, we've all had that friend that puts us in the center of the stage. 
What a beautiful thing that is. What a joyous thing when they're just on the side clapping. That's what makes a great mom, right? Doesn't have to be center stage, but she wants her baby in the middle. Love doesn't need center stage. Okay, let's keep going. You learn anything here? Um, does not boast, is, does not self-promote, is not proud, goes with it. This is doesn't exaggerate self, or the Greek literally says to blow up, to blow up. The idea is that you just get bigger and bigger and bigger until there's no room for anyone else. Um, does not dishonor, this is an interesting one, does not behave publicly, this is the connotation, publicly disgraceful. So in other words, this isn't just about bad behavior, it's about embarrassing the people that you're in community with and publicly. When the Bible teaches about honor, it actually means the same sort of thing. When it says honor your mother and father, that doesn't mean do, do everything your mother and father say. It doesn't mean obey your mother and father. It means that you behave in such a way that the community says, wow, that's a great person. That is a great person. If it gets back to your mom and dad that people are saying, you're a great person, then you're honoring your mother and father. Does that make sense? It's the same here. We've all seen that thing in the grocery store where the four-year-old didn't get the chocolate or the toy that, that they wanted and they're just throwing a fit. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And they're just, we've all seen that. They're just throwing a fit and they're screaming and yelling and being a spoiled, rotten kid. We've all seen it because it was our child. Yeah, right? <laughs> Remember that? Parents? This is what this is. Okay, uh, what was that, number seven? Let's go to number eight. Is not easily angered, not quickly provoked. We skipped one? Number seven? Oh, that's not an important one. Number eight. Um, <laughs> is not self-seeking, does not strive for advantage, does not strive for advantage, does not strive. Which, what that means is it's okay to be ambitious. It's okay to want to move forward in life but you don't do it in a way that diminishes others. You're not striving in a way that ignores others, knocks others down. You, 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 there's always that one person at work trying to take credit for too much. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or when something goes wrong, they have all the emails to prove it's not their fault. Don't be that person is what seven is. And number eight is not easily angered. This is not quickly provoked. It means that you can have someone try to push your buttons and you don't respond. By the way, who's the best at pushing your buttons? Last service, there's a guy right down here who's like, my wife! And I was like, bro, it's Valentine's Day weekend. We know it's true, but don't shout it out. This service goes on Facebook. You are not getting any chocolates. But he's right, he's not wrong. The people that know us the most, the people we live with, your roommates, your mom, your dad, your siblings. When you're a loving person, you find it easy to forgive and you have less buttons to push. Okay, let's move on. Uh, do you wanna know what nine, 10, and 11 is? You have to come back to church next week because Andrew's gonna do those next week. Oh, you say, Kurt, that's very manipulative and unloving. Yes, you're right. <laughs> but at least I'm honest about it. The, ne the, uh, the next to eight we'll do next week. Uh, skip all the way down to a final thought on your text, and I'm gonna give you this one last thought. Um, and it really is true. It really is, listen to me, every single person, listen to me, every marriage that's a little bit stressed, everyone that feels a little bit isolated right now, listen to me carefully. I hope you find love. Sometimes Valentine's Day is just, it's just one big reminder that we haven't found love yet. And I just want to tell you, I hope you find love. I hope you find love. And love is hard to find. In fact, let me correct myself. I don't hope you find love. I hope love finds you. Because sometimes all the striving for love doesn't get you anywhere. In fact, it makes you less lovable. Sometimes it's the giving up that results in the getting. See, here's the reason why. You'll never be a patient person. You'll never be a kind person. You'll never be a lack of envious. You'll never be un easy to, no, not to anger. You'll never find all those qualities. You'll never have all of those qualities. They're too high for you. They're too lofty for you. None of us do those things until love finds us. See, because here's the beautiful thing. If you go up to the 50,000 foot of all these Greek words, 
you realize that what Paul has done is describe one thing and one thing only and described it so accurately. I hope love finds you. And by that, I just got to tell you what I mean is Jesus, he's love. When you find Jesus and you get the love of Jesus in your life, then maybe just then you start to be able to be the patient and kind and loving person that God wants you to be. There's no way for you to give love without getting love. And I'll tell you the most excellent place to get love. Look at each one of these words. Jesus is patient. He delayed giving up on me. There are so many moments where he could have said, I give up on Kurt. He's not worth it. But in every failure, he says, I delay giving up on Kurt. I see in him something no one else does. There is no one more kind than Jesus. He meets every one of your needs. He's literally love in action to the point where he actually meets your need for forgiveness by dying on the cross for you. He's not envious. He wants you to succeed. No one wants you to succeed more than Jesus Christ. He doesn't just want you to live. He wants you to live for eternity. He doesn't just want you to live for eternity. He wants you to live abundantly he's patient and kind he's not envy he's not boastful he didn't promote himself when he was on this earth he's not proud he did not defend himself before his accusers he is the most honorable man that ever lived he is the ultimate example of a moral life not self-seeking my friend not self-seeking not self-seeking Jesus gave up heaven for you and it's this last one that just not easily angered. He could not be provoked. He came into Jerusalem and one day they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And literally two days later, they said, crucify, crucify, crucify. And his response was, not a word of anger. They brought him before three different trials. They brought in false witnesses who lied about him. And the Bible says, like a lamb led to slaughter, he stood before those accusations and he said nothing. His disciples fell asleep and then they abandoned him. He said nothing. They ripped his beard out. They covered his face with a bag. They hit him and while they did, they mocked him. They whipped him and they said, prophesy now, king of the Jews. And he said nothing. They put nails in his wrists and they put nails in his ankles and they lifted the cross up and they put it in a hole. And on that cross, he looked at a thief and he said, today you and I will be in paradise. And he looked at his best friend, John, and he said, take care of my mother. Mother, This is your son. And after the weight of the sin of the world was placed on him, all the pride and lust and greed you and I have ever committed, after all that was put on him, he still did not speak a word of anger. Instead, he filled his lungs with air and he said, forgive them. He could not be provoked. Why? you will never fully understand how much he loves you. But if you get just even a glimpse of it, how committed he is to you, how dear you are to him, if you just even get a tiny bit of revelation of how much he loves you, you will become a patient, kind, honorable, hard to provoke, lover of others, you will find the most excellent way. The second love finds you. Can I ask you to bow your head? Close your eyes. You're here today and you need love to find you, which simply means you need Jesus Christ to come with his love into your life. You've been away from God or you've never fully committed to God. 
I'm going to invite you to let that love into your life right now. Right where you're sitting, I'll pray it out loud. You pray it in your heart. I want you to pray this little prayer of trust, of faith, of surrender to your creator. Right where you're just sitting, just say, Jesus, come into my life. Just pray, Jesus, come into my life. I need your love. I need to know it. Not just know of it, but to know your love, God. Come into my life. Your death on the cross for me, I receive that forgiveness. And now, God, help me. Help me walk in love. Every day and in every way to everyone. Help me find your love. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, no one moving. I'm not gonna make you stand up or come forward. I just wanna pray a prayer of blessing over your life that you would walk in that love. That you would walk in that relationship with your creator. That every day you would grow in that love. If that was you and you just prayed that simple prayer with me, would you do me a favor? Just stick your hand up right now and say, yeah, Pastor Kurt, pray for me. Just keep it up just for a second so I can see every hand. Father, I thank you for every decision that was made, whether it was a recommitment or a first-time commitment, and I pray literally your love would fill their life more and more, day by day, every relationship, every emotion, every circumstance, that your love, your commitment to them, your love for them would inspire them to live the most excellent way. God, help them follow you closely, surround them with people that would increase that love in their life. Bless them. Bless them, bless them. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,